Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will talk about science museums with guests. Allison Brown, the President and CEO of the Science Museum of Minnesota in St. Paul. Linda Silver, CEO of the Perot Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas. And Frank Steslau, President and CEO of the Frost Museum of Science in Miami. So thank you all for coming. This is just a great day to talk about science. Today is the United Nations World Science Day for Peace and Development. And we're celebrating by discussing the importance of science and science museums in our country. So let's go around the table and talk about who you serve and how your institutions advance science education. Let's start with you, Allison. Who do you serve and how do you advance science education? Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having us all here today. And the Science Museum of Minnesota uh, is in Minnesota, as, we, as, uh, as it's from our name. Uh, and we serve the region here uh, with a big focus on Minnesota itself. Uh, we go out, uh, well, pre-COVID, we went out in our vans, our teachers did, and uh, reached all of the region, in, including the very tippy top of the state where you actually have to go up into Canada, then drop back down into Minnesota itself. Uh, and the states that, that are uh, budding of uh, Minnesota. We also then students would come into the museum, but of course, as many of our institutions have had to do, fellow institutions, post COVID, we have flipped all of that to be online. And it's just the teachers and uh, all of our teams done a great job flipping that to be online to serve our students, and most importantly, our families, the teachers, and that's what we're doing. So Linda, when, when uh, you listen to Allison talk about moving to online, how are you functioning uh, over in Dallas? Well, we did the same thing. We closed uh, in March on the 14th and immediately pivoted all of what we were doing for schools and teachers to an online format and are working on how we're going to actually extend that into this next year and trying to be opportunistic about it and thinking about what that means for us in terms of long-term business modeling. What can we be doing to be serving beyond our region? We are a big state um, and the Perot Museum currently reaches a significant portion of that state and beyond. Um, but we'd really like to, to think about what this education technology allows us to do beyond the state of Texas. So in a sense, you're adopting a model that is uh, very similar to what our public schools are, are trying to adopt in different regions, our universities. You're, you're actually, in many respects, going back to the Science Museum as an education center, right, Frank? Yeah, um, I think the question is, you know, long term, how long does that, um, that switch um, carry forward and, and to what extent? You know, we, we here in Miami um, serve a pretty diverse audience and um, have both a combination of residents, but a strong portion of tourists, uh, which were really kind of driving um, our business model. And um, we also have part-time residents, which kind of complicates things further. So um, the online model from an educational standpoint is, is certainly a stopgap. Um, and I think certainly we'll, we'll live on long beyond COVID, but in terms of the, the real business of a museum, um, and we're a museum, an aquarium and a planetarium, um, I think that you know, getting back to some sense of normal and having that in-person business, those in-person touch points is gonna be extremely important. There's nothing that really replaces um, uh, touching and experiencing and the social interactions and it's very difficult to do when everybody is, is afraid about uh, COVID transmissions. We got a, uh, a question from Deirdre, and I'm sorry, Deirdre, if I mispronounce your, your last name, Arajo, and um, uh, she asked about uh, interns and, um, and how you are managing uh, your internships, Frank. Um, how, do you, how do you manage that in this kind of a, a COVID situation? Um, we, we actually, um, as a new museum, I mean, we've only been opened for a few years, um, haven't really developed a robust intern program. We have a few, um, mostly interns and or volunteers associated with our aquarium, um, which requires in-person care uh, during our entire closure period. We had, you know, upwards of still 30 staff in the building working daily, uh, taking care of the animals and the life support systems and the interns and volunteers 
are a critical component of that. So they're treated as other staff are in terms of screening and COVID protocols and other things. And Uli Das asked about, uh, about the whole idea of monetizing these virtual experiences. Uh, Linda, um, are, have you been able to even explore that, that piece or are you still in sort of crisis management and, and uh, reinvention mode? I'd say we've moved past crisis management. We're definitely in reinvention mode. And what we have done on the virtual field trip side of this, if you will, is garner early contributed revenue to help us with the R&D that we need to develop these virtual programs, but also brought in the business modeling of how do we make this a going concern? How does it become earned revenue? Won't necessarily replace all of what we have from the 1.2 million people that we visit that visit us each year or, or come through our outreach programs, but a chunk of it, I believe, um, is, 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 is something that we can do. And so we're looking at that right now. We're in um, the preliminary stages of our next round of um, virtual online programming. Um, and I, we're happy to share what we come out of that with, with the field. Well, in a sense, you're doing what we're trying to do. In, in this time, we're, we're trying from our perspective to provide insider uh, insight into how you are functioning. And, and we're actually trying to give you vehicles for communicating with your donors, with your supporters, with your constituents, so that you can talk about the operations side, the things that people experience viscerally, but, but not personally, um, so that they get a sense. Uh, Allison, um, as you're navigating this, this uh, interesting terrain, how do you connect with audiences if you have to now move to a combination of connection, not just in person, but through this virtual sense, because there are real costs that are associated with uh, these online vehicles. I see Linda nodding. Yes, there are real costs. And, and whatever you do has to be sustainable. These institutions are not built to have you know, major IT departments. And if you do have a major IT departments, just retaining that very expensive staff is just not possible. How are you approaching this? Yeah, so we're doing uh, similar as Linda talked about. We are looking at contributed uh, models, but we also are launching our online programs and part of that will be fee-based as well. Uh, so we're doing the two-prong approach. And in terms of staffing, we are looking at our staff and making certain that we're keeping their st skills up. We're thinking about a culture of digital. So how do we have digital throughout everything that we do? It's not just within one team, one IT department, and it's all burdened on them. It has to go throughout the institution. And those skill sets don't have to be all within our, the Science Museum of Minnesota. Some of it we may use other members that are part of us, so we'll outsource some of it. Um, but also make it certain we keep our skills it's, uh, itself up. And there's a lot of things that we can do with government agencies that are helping build up uh, skills. A lot of it that's online, um, things like this that people can do to build their skill set. So we're thinking about two prong in terms of funding and, and multiple prongs in terms of skill sets. Now, in terms of, of, uh, of the, uh, the staffing cuts, uh, we got a, a question from Sarah Raleigh. Um, the question is that the museum feels under called massive staff cuts through COVID. Um, and as you move forward into rebuilding, what kind of strategies are you, are you considering in order to uh, bring staff back, deal with diversity problems, end up with a situation, you know, th there's that old saw about never wasting a crisis. And really what that is about is the crisis is the canary in the coal mine informing you that, that there are things that need to improve, right? So Frank, as you're, as you're coming out of this, Linda, as you're coming out of this, Allison, um, how are you adjusting so that at the end of this, you're not repeating the model that worked so well for many years, but, have, but has now come into question? Uh, Frank, you wanna, you, you wanna start with, with some of the changes that you're thinking, particularly as it relates to uh, staff and, and, uh, and skilling up and, and ensuring that these people um, uh, are, um, are well used uh, in service to this purpose? You know, I think that's, that's a great question. Um, I think all of us have had substantial impacts to our staff. Um, I think that goes without saying, and you know, we, we, I think we reduced around 30%. Um, and you know, it was an unfortunate situation and, and we're all sort of trying to get through that. But 
coming out the other end, um, I think it's making us think a little more strategically about the programs that we are doing, um, how we shift the business model slightly. Uh, we, were, we were running around 80% earned revenue um, and 20% contributed. Uh, that's not a very diverse revenue stream, particularly when 80% of the 80% earned comes from um, the admissions. So we've started looking at other sources of, of revenue aside from the traditional grants and contributed and, and gate. And with those changes, obviously those are, would bring changes in staffing and expertise. So for example, we are doing educational and environmental programs for one of the major cruise lines. Um, that actually started prior to COVID, but um, is still continuing and growing as, as a piece of, of what we're doing programmatically. And we are now picking up a contract to do uh, educational and environmental programming for a major destination resort in the Turks and Caicos. Um, that's a way both to get our message and our mission out to diverse audiences, um, but also to diversify our, our revenue stream. And again, those programs would come with different expertise and we would certainly be looking for that as we grow. That's really interesting. So you've got the business um, partnerships that are happening with the cruise lines, and then you're also creating new lines of business to create new uh, earned income by leveraging the expertise of your staff. Uh, Linda, how, how are you adjusting so that at the exiting this, you end up with a new pro? So I will um, echo what Frank said. It was incredibly difficult to go through a reduction in force, which we did, and it affected 60% of our staff. So I had a staff of 300 going into this. Um, I will say we were fortunate. We were able to be able to keep those people, all 300 of them paid their full salaries for four months, the first four months that we were closed. Um, but emerging from this becomes something different in terms of how we look at staff and who we recruit. Before we went through the re reduction in force, we used all of our staff and went through an uh, uh, exercise that we called keep, stop, change, move. And while we didn't have a crystal ball to understand what would necessarily happen to programs, we tried to understand what programs and exhibit experiences might be on the other end of this, and then put every single one of our programs through that exercise and made a determination of what was gonna be in the portfolio on the other side. We then kept staff skill set and are hiring for staff skill set that are going to advance us there. So areas of education technology, people who understand that is you know, more important to me now as I look at candidates. But I think there's an important question here about uh, diversity in the field because we all know that there's not a significant amount of diversity. We had started a program a year and a half ago, actually two years now, or a year and a half, um, to diversify our board um, because coming in, I felt it was really important that we had a uh, greater representation at the board level. And so we've started there. And we've also started with our DEAI committee of staff at that level to be thinking about what it is that we need to do to not just be able to recruit um, candidates that don't look like us, but also to be able to retain them. Right. Um, because I think those are two big challenges that we face as a field. And also adjust your programs based on the input. You know, it's one thing to, to uh, give lip service to diversity, equity, and inclusion, but to shift power relationships within organizations is really where the action is, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and I really firmly believe that you've got to have that board um, bought into that. Allison, um, we just completed a poll in which we talked about what, what individuals um, uh, do, do, do the respondents believe benefit most from science museums. It was pointed out uh, by someone online that it's kind of unfair because everybody receives a benefit. Uh, but 76% of respondents say that, the, that children ages 1 through 12 receive the most benefit, 22% to teenagers, you know, 13 to 19 adults a little bit, seniors uh, not at all. Are you shifting um, how you see the value proposition? And, and in terms of your staffing, are you were talking about skilling up and, and, and changing the culture. Are you finding that exiting this, that you're, you're going to um, uh, shift that model and diversify it? Or are you going to stick with it and, and really focus on new ways to deliver values to the same constituents in, this, in the same 
kind of uh, proportion? I think everything that we see with COVID is things that we started pre-COVID and we're just accelerating that work. Um, and that this is for the Science Museum of Minnesota. And I think my conversations with the many leaders, it's the same uh, conversations they were having pre-COVID. And we just have to do it more quickly. Um, we have to do things more online. We have to start the experience online. Uh, and we have to um, continue the experience after people leave online. Maybe people never visit us and that's okay. Um, we have to talk about issues that aren't uh, issues that you might not think about with a science museum. We have to talk about race. We have to talk about mental health. We have to talk about climate change. We have to talk about these topics that are so important to our constituents. And they have to tell us what they want us to talk about. We, ha we can't be ones telling them what they need to uh, listen to us about. We have to kind of get out of the way. Um, we are a place that uh, adults want to come to as well. We know that from our surveying. Uh, and we have to change, uh, as Linda pointed out, we have to make certain that we are a, a diverse uh, set of employees and leaders. And so how do we get out of the way so we have a shared uh, governance and a shared experience? And I think that work actually started pre-COVID and it's even more important now that we continue that work. Uh, and a lot of science museums started actually in, with the space race in the 50s and 60s. And uh, we need to change the way that we think about ourselves and the way that the public thinks about us and that we, we are part of the community. We aren't, uh, we aren't these um, white ivory towers. You know, uh, we, we're in the middle of a, uh, of a uh, poll. It's really interesting. We asked, um, uh, are people of different genders, orientation, race, and so on, and so on uh, equally represented in science and science education? 77% uh, um, of respondents have said that, that uh, different groups are not equally represented and this fact causes harm. So I want to focus on the question of, first of all, if we address that, are there going to be winners and losers? Because very often we find that even if people feel that there is harm, that the way the, the, uh, the addressing it uh, uh, response is formulated is that they're going to be winners and they're going to be losers, right? Is that true? Are there going to be winners and losers if, if, if there's an issue, Linda? I don't think so. I mean, it's, you know, cliche, but a rising tide lifts all boats, right? And I think that we think in those terms coming from um, this field, I think that one of the things that we do need to be very conscientious of is what is our representation in our exhibits, in our programs. Um, we started a year ago, um, a program to go through our exhibit halls and make sure that we were 50-50 gender parity in terms of the number of female scientists uh, uh, male scientists that we were looking at. We're going back and doing some of that same work now to ensure that we have a significant number of people of color who are represented as well. I don't think that that means white males are losing. I think it means that we're all winning and every visitor who comes to the museum has an opportunity, no matter their age, to see themselves reflected somewhere in our halls. And we need to do the same thing with our, um, with our staff, obviously. But I think that there is, there is a point here because if you look at, um, at uh, lived experience as, as a competence, right? If, if, if you look at other competencies like a science discipline, math or uh, physics or biology, I can acquire that competence. I cannot acquire the lived experience of a black woman. I can't. I cannot acquire the experience of uh, uh, a Latinx male. I can't. So in a sense, um, there are things that are about that element that I will never fulfill. So to the extent that those, those elements are criterion for selection, doesn't that create a, a valid perspective that some people are being disadvantaged and some people are being advantaged? Or is it just a matter of everybody is disadvantaged and advantaged in certain ways? I'm tall, so I can do certain things like reach at the top of the shelf that my less tall wife can't, right? I mean, and, and that's never going to change. She, you know, uh, Frank, how do you, how do you view this this whole issue? Because it's tearing us apart as a country, and and we need to address this. We need to hear it. We need to figure out how to how to uh, connect each other so that we have more social cohesion. 
Yeah, you know, I think the, the beauty about science is it can be for everybody. You know, it's, it impacts everyone's lives. It, um, everyone benefits from it to, to different degrees. And I think that the, the challenge is simply in connecting uh, different people with different backgrounds and different attitudes to, to those aspects of science that, that interest them and that get them, you know, sort of more in tune with, um, with their world. And, you know, I think a lot of that revolves around um, us as museums doing good jobs with evaluation um, on our exhibits and our exhibit content and our programs and um, making sure that, that what we set out to do we're actually achieving. And, you know, no one, no one exhibition, no one program is gonna suit everybody, um, but certainly, there needs to be a diversity of those programs and exhibitions so that you are reaching your audiences. There's another issue that is that, that is really- Mark, can I just, can I just respond to that? Uh, also, uh, when you look at study after study shows that scientists ends up with a better solution when they have a diverse uh, group at the table. And that's diversity of gender, uh, race, life experiences, socioeconomic backgrounds. You just end up with better scientific outcomes. And you actually end up with better businesses um, financially. Uh, uh, in terms, if you measure in terms of revenue, in terms of profitability, and there are all sorts of studies you can go and find it, whether it's from McKinsey or um, other people looking at this. So uh, you know, it's not a zero sum game. Um, and so it's not that somebody's being left out because somebody else um, gets a place at the table. It's actually that we all end up with a, with a better economy and actually a much larger economy. It's such a good point, right? I mean, you want to be able in a business to sell to everybody. So you have to design products for everybody. And, and what you don't know is going to hurt you, right? So yeah. go ahead. No, I was going to say, and there are examples, um, and some of them are in the space uh, 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 race. Um, of some very deadly examples where people weren't listened to that had devastating consequences. Well, that's, that's, that's also really interesting, this, this idea of blind spots and um, blind spots where we're so blind that we don't even know that we're blind, right? So let's talk a little bit about something that we were, we were chatting about before the show, and that's the idea of science, science and the importance of science. Linda, you want to give the first shot in terms of the importance of science and this this whole idea of information, disinformation, casting doubt, it, it hits the virus, it hits all sorts of different aspects, uh, climate change, the whole uh, question of, of, of what is the role of education in advancing um, uh, evidence-based practices. Uh, uh, take your shot at, at, at this incredibly complicated topic. Thank you. <laughs> it is incredibly <laughs> complicated, but it's what we deal with every day, right? It's about how do we make really complex um, information and evidence, as you said, accessible to the general public, and how do we get them to see that science is for them, even if they're not going to go into a career in science and technology, just understanding um, of the science to be able to apply to their own lives and to decisions they make, right, in those lives. One of the challenges I think we have as a country and as a field we haven't really uh, come to grips with is we don't do a very good job of teaching the nature of science. And so you end up with people who believe or don't believe in science. Well, you don't get to believe or not believe in science, right? Science is about either accepting the evidence for an argument or rejecting that evidence. It's not about blind faith, it's not about belief. And what we, I think, have, have trouble with is understanding how science really operates. And therefore, kind of because we don't understand that, I think either distance ourselves, sometimes are suspect of it, et cetera. And, and, and it's something that the, the field itself hasn't necessarily tackled yet, either in formal science education, in schools and universities, or in our informal um, spaces as well. I think that's one of the ways that we can get to creating more accessible science for more people. And if I could just tag on to that for a second, Mark, the, um, you know, in my opinion, the science has a, a branding problem and a marketing problem more than it does anything else. And I, and I think that the way we teach science historically 
as this sort of clean process of scientific method with observation and a hypothesis and evidence. Um, while those are important components of scientific discovery, that's not how science works. You know, data sets can be noisy. There can be outliers that are statistical outliers. Scientists are often looking for very small differences and, and nuances in data that can be, you know, temporally different or spatially different. And, you know, I think the fact that people don't understand that basic premise of science allows science to be hijacked by either politicians or misinterpreted by the media. And I think if people had a better understanding of those complexities, what, what is that process? Um, it would be more difficult for um, somebody to misinterpret it. And, and I think would, would go a long way. So I think our goal as, as a museum and as a science communication institution is to try to clarify that for the public, to try to get the public to understand that science can be messy. Um, there can be disagreements. But at some point, there's a consensus developed around an issue, and that consensus is, is what science ends up being. We just took a poll, um, and there, I, I saw that there's, <laughs> there's an erroneous entry here um, uh, as, as well in the poll. But the poll basically asked whether there's a growing sentiment in this country of belief in science or disbelief in science. And it basically split uh, pretty much 50-50. You know, I, I look at this as, a question of belief in evidence or disbelief in evidence. Um, Allison, do you, how do you interpret this whole idea of, of uh, evidence or belief in evidence, disbelief in evidence, um, and, and the whole train of logic that is, is science? Um, how, do we, how do we look at that? Because so much of our success in, in business you know, whether it's development of new technologies uh, to extract uh, oil and gas, fracking and so on, or treatment of disease and this very promising vaccine that's coming out with, from Pfizer with, with the possibility of a 90% success rate. Um, you would have referred previously to uh, the space race and, and our success is there. Um, the, the move from combustion engines to electric engines for, for our automobiles so much of our success is based in science. Um, how do you see this? Because if we start to attack that basis of America's success in the world, uh, could we just be, be uh, sawing, the, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot? Well, I think if we did that, we, we would be shooting ourselves in the foot. I don't think the general public is actually um, headed that direction. And I base that on a study that 3M does every year on the state of science. And they released a new poll just recently on the state of science in 2020. And a science skepticism has actually declined for the first time in three years. Uh, and I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to look at it quickly on my phone here, hard to see. But based on that, I would say that we have opportunity to keep science skepticism down. And there's just been a lot of noise. It's gotten a lot of press um, about science skepticism. And I, so I, have, I think that we are on the right road to uh, improve science trust. And we know that museums are one of the most trusted institutions in our nation. And that's not from science museums, that's from polling done by outside people. And we have an opportunity to help uh, keep building that trust. And I think that's a great role for museums and for science museums in particular. Do you all see your institutions as advocates for science? You bet. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great role for us in partnership with others. Now, is, is that a political statement or is that just a, a, um, a, a uh, advocation? Uh, well, oh. No, go. Go ahead, go ahead Linda. I was say, in terms of um, advocates, I think it's a primary role for us, right? We should be inspiring um, minds and providing access um, to science. I think where it starts to become politicized, as you're saying, is are you um, are you taking a side? Are you creating um, a message that is coming from the museum and falls on one side or the other? And I think that has historically been a big challenge in our field because we've always wanted to say, our, our donors have always wanted to say, our board has always wanted to say, our staff has always wanted to say, oh, it's it's just science, it's, it's neutral. You have to present all of the um, evidence and then people will make up their own mind. But I think that we need to be able to show 
um, what that process is and guide people in those directions. I don't think that it is as easy as we're just black and white e equals MC squared. There you have it. I guess it's the distinction between starting with a conclusion that you're trying to prove or starting with a hypothesis where you're looking at evidence to see whether it's true or false, right? Those are, uh, th there's a distinction there. When you start with a conclusion, then, then you already know where you wanna end up, right? When you start with a hypothesis, you have an idea that you wanna test. And I guess, I guess that's, that's the distinction here. And I guess you are all advocates for starting off with ideas and testing to see whether they work. Yes, and I, I don't know, if, Mark, if this is what you're saying, but there are some points of view that I I would we would not put on our museum floor, um, you know, and that would be um, climate denier, climate change denier, vaccine anti-vaxer, um, you know, uh, somebody believing that that white uh, supremacy is is right. Um, anti-masking, I wouldn't, you know, those are, there's, there are just certain things we would not put on our museum floor that go against um, statements that our board has approved. Um, so I, these, I, I don't know if that's these, what you mean. Is, is the logic because the evidence doesn't exist? So for example, race, right? Color of skin is not connected to anything else other than color of skin, right? Right. Um, you know, it's not it's not uh, connected to any capability or anything else. There's no evidence for that. Right. Right. And it's the same thing that you're siding with, you know, the anti-masking piece. There is very strong scientific evidence um, that masking will reduce viral transmission. Uh, Frank, are you taking the same approach of, of basically um, ensuring that whatever you you provide is not a political statement or a statement of just faith, but also is based in evidence. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly it. That you know, the, the, the topics we present are topics where um, you know there's a, a a large consensus of scientists agreeing on on what that science is, and we use the scientists' own voices in many ways. To tell those stories and that's where we can um, help inspire uh, by showing the diversity of the scientific community um, that scientists you know are not always white men in lab coats um, and you know i think that 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 goes a long way um, th those voices and and i think the more voices you have on a topic um, the more supportive the, the public is going to be in in terms of understanding it and Linda, we'll, we'll give you the last word. We're coming to the end of our time. So um, this, is, this is your moment. Tell us about um, the future of science education in the United uh, States as, as embodied in an institution like the Pro. Right, the whole future in my, in my mind. It, 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 uh, it's all on you. Yeah, great. Um, well, I think that I think we've got an, a long way to go, but I think that we've got some very optimistic um, milestones that we're seeing in front of us. When uh, with this pandemic, for example, how more in your face can you be about the future of humanity needing to depend on science, needing more people to be invested in science, whether that's personally, philanthropically, or otherwise? I think um, this potentially is an inflection point of not just how important science is to us in our everyday lives, but also um, how important it is um, to be teaching about it and teaching about it in, in different ways as we're having to learn how to do that now. I think that science museums still have a fundamental role of welcoming visitors into our galleries and into our exhibits. How much of that is done physically or in a modified way going forward, we'll see. Um, but I guess what we also know is that this is not the last big issue that humanity is going to face that science can solve. I think that's a great, it's a great exit line. The future of humanity uh, being to a great extent dependent on, among other things, science. The idea of belief in science, the belief in evidence, the ability to respond to it. Add to that our values, our form of, of democratic uh, government that involves people, 
there are all sorts of different elements of, of value and faith, but science certainly belongs uh, amongst those uh, elements that will determine human, uh, humanity's faith. Uh, thank you so much for being part of this. Uh, Allison Brown, President and CEO of the Science Museum of Minnesota in St. Paul, Linda Silver, CEO of the Perot Museum of Nature and Science in Dallas, and Frank Steslau, uh, President and CEO of the Frost Museum of Science in Miami. Attendees, thank you so much for your participation. Come back again on Thursday. We'll have a very interesting open mic discussion on how to use media and the future of media in promoting nonprofits, organizations like these. Everybody mask up, stay safe, and we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you so much for, for, for coming, all of you.